Tucci. How you doing? Hi, Sebasti. Hi, hey. Please request to join the live so that I can add you to the live while we wait for other people to join. How are you doing, Tilti? <laughs> Tupasa, please request to join the live. There's a little thing at the bottom of the screen, I think. That says um, request to join live, and then I will accept it. Hello, hello, hello. Thanks for joining, y'all. Hi, Sharon. Hello. Hi, DJ Knight. How are you doing? I'm super. I need you to please request to join, and then I will. Um, Add it to the live. While I wait, um. okay, great. You have requested to join. Go live with. Okay. Hello, hello, hello. hello. Thank you guys for joining. Hi. Hi. Hello. I'm doing well. Good to be here. Thank you for the invite. You're most welcome. So, um, I think we will just start. Um, hopefully others will join. Otherwise, you can watch it on IDTV. So, uh, I have already met you once over the phone, but my name is Itoha, just in case you forgot. So, um, uh, I thought you were the perfect other person to have this uh, IG live series with. Um, so we've come to ask you a ton of questions. And uh, I feel like this would be a great conversation because you have a lot of experience in this space. Already. Oh, really? <laughs> First of all, please tell us who you are. Who is Sipasi? So um, I'm Sipasi. Nigerians call me a farmer, but in the, here in the U.S., um, they call me a researcher, and um, some some part of it call me um, hunger fighter because of the work I do in the grassroots. Basically, I run an organization in Nigeria, um, Protect Ozone, where we train children, youth, women, farmers okay. in sustainable agricultural practices to fight extreme poverty and eating hunger in order to improve their livelihood. So. Okay. Um, the focus of the work I do. Oh, you asked me to tell you about myself, not my work, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. So, um, yeah, as you can see, I am a Nigerian, a very passionate one at that. Um, I did my first degree at the University, Federal University of Technology, Akure, where okay. I studied animal production and health. Um, for my master's, I went to um, the University of Ibadan, where people call the first and the well i don't know <laughs> yeah where i had my master's degree in animal science and um currently in the united states for my um doctoral program in agriculture and natural resources with focus on sustainable agriculture um before now i've worked with um several organizations local and international organization in the agricultural sector um, as you can see, I was born in 1987. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I think I'm a bit old, but I'm young. <laughs> Anyways, so I have um, a bit of experience in the agricultural development world. So awesome. I, I work with ECHO. ECHO is the Education Concern for Hunger Organization based in Florida. Um, however, I work with the branch in um, West Africa and East Africa. That is in Arusha, that is Tanzania, and uh, Burkina Faso, Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, where we train uh, missionaries, um, 
Uh, yeah, in Nigeria, we trained missionaries, you know, those that work mostly in the northern part of the country okay. on how to, because we know missionaries are power holders in their communities. You know, sure. we train them on sustainable agriculture in order to take it back to their communities to, you know, train people. It's not only about, you know, yeah. just preaching the good food, but the sustainability part of it. Um, mm -hmm. In East Africa, we worked with... Um, uh, Maasai farmers, Maasai farmers. Like, they get to the work you are already doing. Um, oh, yeah. So, back back <laughs> a little bit. so, you said you have a bachelor's from investing in a query in animal, I think something animal. Production. Yeah, animal. production animals. Right. Um, did you, did you, was it like you desired to do this from the very beginning? Or after you got into it, you now, it's like a passion, you know? So I was not I was not part of the population that was forced into agriculture because of the academic, <laughs> you know. So um, it's had been my it has been my passion. It was a childhood passion, um, yeah. And um, I could remember when I was very little, um, at the age of eight, I grew up with my grandparents. Mm -hmm. They bought me one cock and one hen. So that was where I started my career. You know, oh. so I mean, don't be surprised how passionate I am about it because it's something that was in my blood. You know, I grew with it, ah, and I see, I see. yeah, okay. it was so in the future. It has oh, no. all there. right, right. So I felt, what can I do in the university that would be seamless? So I thought mm -hmm. I should just continue with what I used to do because I could remember back then. You know, when people have issues with their flock, you know, yeah. um, with their flock back, back in Shagamu, Ogun State, you know, I seem to be progressing, you know, multiplying and everything. Mm -hmm. So I felt, okay, probably this is the calling. This is my calling. And mm -hmm. um, I pressed hard on it. And uh, today, glory to God that we are here. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, so you, you said you have an, or, an NGO, right? right. Uh, protect Ozone. Can you right. tell us about that? When did it start? So, um, the idea behind it. We started Protect Ozone in the year 2015. Okay. So um, I was invited. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Please, guys, Fine. feel free to ask questions as we um, talk because we all want you guys to be a part of the conversation. So please feel free to ask questions and I will pitch them to him as we go on. So as you were saying. So, yeah, I was invited to Tanzania, ECHO in Tanzania, um, Education Concern for Hunger Organization, to present my um an idea on how to increase the milk let down of local dairy cattle you know okay yeah like an average ocean frazian hosting frazians which is a breed of cattle you know, um, i think um uh, i sound to be corrected you know originated from denmark you know mm -hmm. they produce about 60 liters of milk in a day now wow. take a look at this for a cattle to produce 60 liters of milk, average of 60 liters of milk in a day, while our local Fulanese in mm -hmm. Nigeria produces an average of two liters, not even 10% of it. So you can see the deficit. So I designed a project around that, and um, I was invited by Echo in Tanzania to come present that project, you know, mm -hmm. to Maasai farmers. Maasai farmers are the shade of the... Um, of the Fulani cattle areas we have in Nigeria. So mm -hmm. on my way to Tanzania, you know, um, through Ethiopia, the airliner said, on behalf of each passenger on board, we are planting a tree each. So I was like, where is the connection between the tree you are planting, my flight? Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't see the connection then, you know, on the little display screen, they showed us climate change, how it's affecting the globe and everything. Then on our way, so they told us that, yeah, they told us that the trees are, mm -hmm. yeah, they told us that these trees will be planted in the flight origin. So automatically the trees were to be planted in Tanzania. So mm -hmm. I paid for you to plant trees, oh, sorry, in, in Ethiopia. So I paid for you to plant trees in Ethiopia. So on our way back to Nigeria, they said, thank you for using Ethiopian airline without a promise of planting a tree. I was like, oh, so I paid you guys to plant trees in your country and not my country. So wow. as a passionate youth, you know, I was like, what can I do to help my country? What can I do to, you know, also do same, even though it will never be in that capacity? Yeah. You know, but can I contribute my little? 
you know, to what I'm doing. So I started going to the grassroots, you know, I trained people on how to plant trees, you know, give them free seeds and everything. So I was just doing that out of love and passion, you know. And um, in 2017... Not as, as an, an individual. Yeah, as an individual, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, then in 2017, I mean, later part of 2016, um, I got a mail from um, the G20 summit in Germany. Um, they were like, okay, we needed a youth that has experience in agriculture, mm. you know, has studied agriculture and also has a grassroots experience of agriculture. Mm. Then I was with one, one organization as one of their champions in Nigeria. Mm. And I was nominated by one champion to be on it. So, you know, that was how I went to Germany. You know, I was at the G20 platform. I was like, oh my God, the little work I do in my room. And you yet? No, not yet. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, the li well, I've started the NGO, but not as an NGO. You know, I've brought people together that believed in the vision and we're running together. So I, I was shocked with how the little work I do in my rural community, mm -hmm. in very hard to reach communities across Nigeria, you know, is giving me this massive opportunity, you yeah. know, to go to Berlin. And that was the first time, you know, I'll be leaving Africa, you know. Mm -hmm. So I got there, you know, I addressed a wonderful population of world leaders, you know, the who is who across the world. You know, it wow. was... Um, a life-changing experience for me and mm. i was like okay i didn't actually see the job i could do back in nigeria that could have given me such an opportunity within a very short time mm. so i was like okay i could do this little in my community and it's giving me this opportunity mm. then it's worth to live my life on my yeah. passion so yeah. i stayed on my passion so mm. uh yeah so when i go back to nigeria yeah, in 2017, we got registered with CSE, Corporate Affairs Commission in Nigeria, okay. as a fully-fledged NGO in Nigeria. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that was how we started Protector Zone. Um, That's so, very interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Especially because from what you said, you had, you had, you first started it off as an individual, right? Trying to right. know what you could do. And then right. gathered a few people before... Right. It was even like a corporate NGO and all that. So right. that that is um, very interesting. And I feel like there are other people also trying to do things like that. And the mindset is, can we? Does let me set up set up the system. Let me do the CAC. Let me do all of that, and then I can now start running. Right? right. Can you talk to those people just for a few minutes? Because I know someone actually sent me a question on Twitter about this yesterday because he wanted to ask you. Um, about this i figured i'll just pose it to you so he wants to start something like that but from what you said it's not just about setting up less than registry putting all the red doing the registration and all of that it starts from you doing something so please speak to that so now um it is very good to learn to be under mentorship and to fully learn so many people run into NGO because, you know, sometimes I'm a picture lover. I post a lot of pictures and, you know, I get a lot of likes in hundreds, sometimes in thousands on Facebook. But people are actually quick to celebrate the work we do. But most times they don't understand what goes into it. Mm. They don't understand our pains. They don't understand the struggles. So an NGO is not a place, <clears throat> an NGO is not government organization and is also not for profit organization, mm -hmm. you know. So you need to understand what you are going into if you want to start up an NGO. And again, you need to understand that you have to have a track record. So if you don't have a track record, there's no way you can be successful in the NGO world. Yeah. So what helped me to the glory of God was the fact that when I started alone, mm -hmm. I was documenting. I have very good documentation skills. You know, not even very good documentation skills. You know, I take pictures of the process. You know, I never knew it was going to be an NGO. I was just taking pictures. You know, archiving them and stuff like that. You know, then when the time came for me to start up an NGO, you know, I already had about two years track record. Mm -hmm. You know, 
Anytime I put out application for opportunities and stuff like that, people look at your track record. People want to know you. It's not about having money and, you know, you registering. I mean, registering an NGO is about, in, in Nigeria, ranges from about $600 to $1,000. US So it's not something cheap. I mean, I know we're addressing population in Africa. I'm talking about it's maybe from 200,000 Naira to about 400,000 Naira for you to register an NGO in Nigeria. So it's quite expensive. You know, you might have that money, have an office space and have everything to yourself, you know. But the fact is, the knowledge might not be there. You know, mm. so track record, very important. For example, the first grant we got, you know, was as low as $500. That's one than, as at that time, $160,000 or thereabout. That was the first grant we ever got. You know, the second we got another yeah. $500, the third we got was about $1,000. The next we got was about $5,000. The next we got was about $10,000. You know, let me stop there so that, you know, well, <laughs> you know. So that was a track record. You know, we started very low. So, you know, if you are starting up an NGO, it has to be your own track record. Yeah. And most especially, people don't value um, voluntary work. You need to volunteer, you know. It's true. I think there is to an extent an African theme. Oh, it's loading. Let's wait, wait, finish loading. Sorry, oh, there seems to be a network problem on our guest's end. Hmm. Okay. Um, can you please resend an in invitation so that we can add you, re add you to the call? Well, that's the live. Okay. Great. This should work. Hi guys, thank you for joining. Sorry, that was sick. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. A lot of technological issues here. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, as I was saying, the track record is very important. Yeah. So, when people see you excelling as an NGO, that means you really put in the work. So, yeah. you can't put in the work. You, I mean, if you don't put in the work, you cannot, you know, expect an output. You know, another mistake people do is that, you know, because they want to start up an NGO, you know, they tend to create a problem that does not exist, then pipes <laughs> you know, are to the problem that does not exist. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, because they just want to start an NGO, they want to put pictures out there, they want to be quick to be celebrated, you know. Yeah. I mean, this, in fact, it was not even my intention to start up an NGO, you know. I mean, I woke up one morning and I started got getting messages on WhatsApp. Oh, Sipasi, I saw your picture, your billboard along the airport road. Oh, I saw your picture. You know, I was living in Ikorodu in a very rural community and the federal government placed my picture strategically across Lagos, even on the island. You know, I don't have the resources to stay on the island, but because of the work I do, you know, it has actually positioned me strategically to where I am today. So I feel that it is not about, if you want to start up an NGO, it is not about the gain of it, but the mm -hmm. impact, you know. So we have to be passionate about the impact and not just the benefit, you know. I had no idea when I started, you know, that there were opportunities, you know, embedded in voluntary service, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was saying something about voluntary service. I mean, our right. youth in Nigeria should understand the mm -hmm. power of voluntary service. I mean, yeah. Itong, I have to tell you that I have never worked for anybody with my two hands to receive a salary, you know, and I will be 33 in about, in September, on the 9th of September, I have not worked to receive a salary from anybody. But mm -hmm. I have worked passionately all my life, volunteering. I volunteer with One Africa, I volunteer with ECHO, I volunteer with rural and local organizations, voluntary services overseas. You know, mm -hmm. mention the organization in Nigeria that I have not volunteered with. You know, so it's called community service. And through the yeah. volunteer period, I was able 
you know, to gain skills, you know, that is necessary to push ahead in life. Even mm-hmm. running my PhD, you know, I wrote a, a paper um, recently that I'll be presenting in September as well. You know, yeah. um, I'll be presenting that paper at the, um, at the UN, United Nations in September. Um, it was the work I have done in the past as a development yeah. worker. Then I wrote it into a research paper. You know, mm. so that is track. I was able to keep track of that, and now yeah. I'm writing it a research paper. So that is actually very amazing. So we should learn to give to. Our, I'm not saying that you should not get a job if you need one. And again, you know, know your boundaries and be yeah. able, you know, to 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 give back to the society. It's very important. You know, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um. So we're going to take this to be kind of the last question on this and you volunteer space and then we would just go into the agricultural issues and actually expound on those. So I have a question here. I think this is someone that knows you. So it says, Sipas, great to hear from you. Um, was it great to hear from you once again. Please, can you talk about your experience at Carrington Youth Fellowship on Nigeria and how, is, how it has positioned you for the work ahead? So, um, Carrington Youth Fellowship is an initiative of um, is an initiative of the U.S. Consulate in Lagos. Um, so, you will notice that U.S. Consulate is on Water Carrington Road. I mean, the town. You should know this. <laughs> yeah, it's on Water Carrington. Road. So, Water Carrington happens to be the first U.S. ambassador to Nigeria. So, this, yeah. Oh, yeah. I met him in person. <laughs> so the fellowship was named after him. So the fellowship is what a Carrington Youth Fellowship Initiative, like Carrington Youth Fellowship Initiative, sci-fi for sure. So it's actually a fellowship that selects about 20 to 25 young people in Lagos State and Poraco. Okay. But, but Poraco is out of it now, you know. So in Lagos State, that are passionate about what they do, and um, they place them on a year-long fellowship with the U.S. Consulate, you know, okay. um, for training. Then the fellows are funded in groups, not individually, to a tune of about um, five thousand U.S. dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, to implement a project in Lagos, you know, or Poracot, but Poracot is out of it now, as I said. So mm-hmm. it is actually um, an important. Um, part of my life as because the local farmer I used to be and I'm still proud to be a very local farmer um, it helped place me mm. in a very professional setting okay. to know number one how to relate with people outside your culture you know mm. yeah uh, that's a skill to have right I mean it all, you, you, you might actually understand that you know it's very different for you to be a Nigerian and just Nigerian alone, you know. And it is also different for you to be a Nigerian and also have experience in other African countries. You know, that means you are a Nigerian and you, are, you also have the experience on how to relate with other Africans. Yeah. It is a total ball game for you to be a Nigerian and to relate with developed countries, mm. you know. So sci-fi gave me the opportunity, you know, um, to to have an experience like yeah. to bridge the graph from my local community and international development international world, so I got selected for that fellowship, and um, I was on it for one year. During the fellowship, I put in my best as a rural farmer. You know, I put in my best, and at the end of the fellowship, I was awarded the um, U.S. U.S. Consular General's Award. Okay. You know, which was presented by the then U.S. Consul General John F. Bray, and also this amazing Nigerian American Partnership Award. So I got it to, you know, uh, after the fellowship year. So it added a lot to yeah. uh, my my development. So the person also had my experience with one Nigeria. So one Nigeria is part of one Africa. Uh, one one Africa was actually that particular platform, another voluntary platform. So you should know that Carrington Fellowship is also a voluntary platform. One Africa is also a voluntary platform. So mm-hmm. it's 
it's a platform that gave me an outstanding opportunity to leave Africa for the first time. And um, I will always credit it to God and also mm -hmm. them supporting the trip. So they were the one that actually sent me to G20 Summit, financed me, put me on a business class, you know, and everything to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to, to G20 Summit. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they needed me. They saw that what I do, the work I do in my rural community is important. And they mm -hmm. felt the world has to hear about it. Yeah. I was denied my visa to Germany, but mm -hmm. they stood on their feet. You know, they contacted the right people and um, they made sure that I got my visa. They made sure I had a very good trip to Germany. And mm -hmm. they gave me very good media attention in Germany. So, I mean, I never knew that this was going to come with a package. It yeah. was not for every fellows of the of, of one every fellow of one africa but mm -hmm. you know the track record i was able to build over the years you know when they needed someone to represent in agriculture there was no other go-to person than sipasi which i am really grateful to god for the opportunity and i also appreciate one africa for investing so much in that mm -hmm. so that was what that okay. has you know, that yeah. that's the question of how the Carrington Youth Fellowship and One Nigeria helped him on, rather yeah. helped on your journey. Obviously, so please, if you are interested in going to that, from what you said, that is a great way to get out there, as I say. Yeah. Okay, so you have worked with a lot of grassroots farmers and, let's say, organizations and all that. What would you say are the top two challenges as at the very base, right? The top two challenges that um, farmers have or the challenges that are there on the agriculture chain from your experience working with them directly. So market? Market? Okay. No. This is work. <laughs> hey, we'll be back soon. Sorry, y'all. Yes, sir, we cannot see you. Oh, see my. You. I don't know what's happening here. Yeah. Okay. Can you see? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I mean, you know. It happens. Technology yeah. comes with a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So you are so, saying market? Market and um, on-site. Market and appropriate technology. Market and appropriate technology. Okay. Yeah. Can you address the market side? So, it is extremely difficult, extremely difficult for our farmers to access market. Mm. Imagine the production line, imagine about 70% of our farmers being smallholders. Mm. This is a subject that really touches my heart a lot. Less than 3% of Americans are farmers, less than 3%, because of the technology and um, a single farmer in the U.S. can farm about 50,000 hectares of land, mm. you know, because of the technology, with very little manpower, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, they grew in hundreds of hectares of land. But back at home, our farmers do um, less than two hectares of land, you know, on the average. So about 70% of our population in Africa happens to be in farming or agricultural related sector, you know. So that is very huge in order to meet up with the food demand. About 70% of our food production comes from this rural sector, this local sector. So we need to understand these things. Now, for them to access the market, these people, because they have, 
you know, less than two hectares, and these two hectares are not in the cities, then the rural communities, you know, we're talking about Ibesa, Land, Toro, Inabe, Okuta, you know, farm mm -hmm. settlement, Ago farm settlement, Ilope, Juayekwe farm settlement, Ikorodu farm settlement is extreme, almost in Ogo State. So these places are far apart. So mm -hmm. for them to transport their food, I mean, their produce to the market, is a problem. Then we have market associations, banana Associate uh, banana marketers association, tomato something association. So if you're a farmer, you have your produce and you take it to market. Mm -hmm. This association will not allow it to go into the market. They might actually have your truck of tomato, your, your tomato seated in your truck because you are not part of the association and they will allow it to rot while there's no tomato in the market. Mm -hmm. So that those clusters are very powerful in Africa. We need to understand them. The truth is, there's nothing we can do about it other than to integrate or to leverage on technology, you know, to, mm. to bypass it, you know. So that is the only thing that can happen. So there should be an intentional effort. Like, I worked with um, the Federal Minister of Agriculture and Rural um, Federal Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, FMAD, in Abuja for a while before coming to the US. And um, I discovered that even the government is not as powerful, you know, to break the bond of these associations, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I feel enough effort is not being made. You know, the farmers put in a lot of effort, sleepless nights and everything into production. And mm -hmm. an, aggregator, an aggregator will come, we price the farmer so low, mm. more times the, yeah. the, 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 the aggregators are the price takers. Yeah. Which is so mm. sad. Imagine, mm. now it all, imagine your dad being a farmer. Mm. After putting in so much effort, then the buyer comes and say, oh no, now you can't sell this one for this. This is the amount I'm going to buy it. But because your dad doesn't want to continue incurring costs. Yeah. They have to sell it at all costs. They don't mind selling it lower than the cost of production. Yeah. So that is the, it, 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 it's a tragedy in Africa that we are not looking into. And this is actually making farmers remain in the triangle of disaster mm. in Africa. So what do I mean by triangle of disaster? Poverty, unemployment in the rural areas, you know, and climate change. So when I talk about unemployment in the rural areas, so young people in the rural areas mm -hmm. are not even in agriculture again. They've moved to cities and become bike riders, I mean, motorcycle riders and stuff. And you have little youth in the urban areas trying to do agriculture is fancy, which is fine. Agriculture is fancy. People are doing this and that, but it cannot give us the food we need. You know, the food we need in Africa is actually in the rural areas. Then how can we have, you know, rural youth empowerment strategy? Mm. You know, what I call RES, rural youth empowerment strategy, to keep yeah. youth rural areas, provide them with necessary resources to live there. For example, mm. if I have access to internet, water, power, I mean, I'll be very happy and excited to live in a yeah. very rural community, you know, but... Yeah. If these resources are not there and, you know, my, my, my labor is not being paid for well, then I'm going to look for an alternative. So these youth yeah. have migrated from the rural areas. You know? So mm -hmm. this is actually affecting markets in a very um, hard way. Then the second thing I talk about is um, appropriate technology. Yeah, well, before we so, get to appropriate technology, okay. um, I just want to uh, take us a step back to what you said about the associations preventing let's say, small farmers from... Okay, we have a question. Let me just quickly finish the thought. Um, what you said about the associations preventing the access of small farmers to the market. Actually, I think this question ties in with that. Do farmers not have their own associations to represent their interest? That's a great question. Okay, that is a very good question. But I was developing a document with Agra recently that asked almost the same question. Mm. But, you know, 
farmers association in Nigeria are fragmented, fragmented rather. So this does not make them that powerful to get things done. Mm. Farmers association is different from market association. Let's take a look at PAN, Poultry Association of Nigeria. Mm. You know, they are, are not, I have no contact with them, even though I produce chicken at my backyard in Lagos. You know, so now this farmers association, most farmers association focus on very large farms, you know, farms that are very well to do. But most of them are neglecting the most important part of it, which is the small orders. Now, small orders, when you aggregate the small orders, is far more than 70%, 70 more than what the very big farms are producing. So now, that means that all farmers associations should find a way of integrating small orders of specialties. So when I talk about small orders of specialties, probably Google small orders, how can we bring them to it? Now, yeah. you cannot have a voice if you don't bring the 70% of the small orders into the system. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So the 30% cannot give you the voice you are looking for. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So you need that 70% to join you, to give you that particular voice. And this has to be bottom-top approach and mm -hmm. also yeah. up-bottom approach. You know? mm -hmm. So the government must know the system has to, you know, it's just so sad that our system does not kiss each other. You know, mm -hmm. like, why should I have a driver's license, my international passport, and you get to a place, they are not accepting your international passport. You get to another place, they need your driver's license. You get to another place, they need your school ID. I mean, yeah. as yeah. an international student in the United States of America, you know, just your driver's license, then you are fine. You mm -hmm. know, so these things are fragmented, fragmented in all aspects of our country. So yeah. if you have it fragmented, so it's not going to, you know, hold water. But I mean, um, so you have said that the associations are, the people they have in the associations or the markets, or rather the farmers are the large scale farmers, right? And they seem to have neglected the 70%, which is the small scale farmers. What prevents the small scale farmers from joining those associations? Because I assume that your membership in, in a some group is by choice. So what prevents them? Is it that there is an it's like there's an entry embargo that they cannot, you know, they cannot cross. So see, let us be real with ourselves and um, I mean let me talk as an African now. You know, the disparity between the 30% and the 70% is wide. Mm. The, the complex, the inferiority and superiority complex between the small holders and the big large, farmers, large, large farmers, you know, it's just too wide. I mean, mm. the question we need to ask is, is there a common table for them to meet? Mm. You know, this is a question we need to ask ourselves, mm -hmm. you know. And when you talk about it, I served in Akwai Bomb State, a back to be precise. I know of one time commissioner for agriculture that has a poultry farm on one acre of land, just one acre of land, mm. and has about two tractors and tractors implements. Poultry farm, you don't need a tractor to be there. But he has access to government resource and he was able to draw the government resource into his own poultry farm. You know, mm. then we have massive we have massive what's it called small loaders around that need such implements but they don't have access to it so mm -hmm. that disparity is much you know yeah, yeah. and um, again we need to understand the struggles of the small loaders you know i'm talking about this because uh, not because i read it in the pages of book but because i saw its life mm -hmm. you know, yeah i was a small older farmer I worked at the presidency mm. on very important agricultural projects across Nigeria. So yeah. I understand what I'm saying. You know, the disparity is too much. And because of the struggles of the small holders, the struggles are so real. You know, mm. when do you come call for meetings? Where do you call for meetings? You know, mm. that is why local... So when you call for meeting in Abak, for example, 
I mean, you are in a back, a rural farmer is in a back, you know, and you are calling for a meeting at Equality Idiom, another local government. How do you want that, you know, um, farmer to get there as a smallholder? You know, they have their struggles to meet up. They want to meet up with their uh, family, whatever. You know, they want to keep record and everything. They don't have the resources. Then that is why local chapters of farmers' association are so important. You know, mm. the farmers then it's aggregated up. So it has to be an institutional. You know, um, it's an institutional problem. So mm -hmm. we have to look for an institutional solution. That is, you know, building institution at the grassroots level, you know, yeah. to the top, you know, that is going to help. Then what stops our farmer and what stops our government from creating a system that aggregates, you mm. know, like you want to aggregate from the local farmers, then you pay them for their labor. You know, mm. you want to incentivize the rural, the local farmers, you pay them for their labors. You know, the, I think the government, let me tell you, the government of Nigeria is doing a lot in the agricultural space. You know, but monitoring and evaluation is so poor. Yeah. Oh my God. Monitoring yeah. and evaluation is so poor. I go to rural places and I see people that have access to it, to, to, to the facilities provided by the federal government. You know, these things don't trickle down most times. These are yeah. things I saw highs and unfortunately, there's nothing much I could do about it at that particular time. But I think we are going to a place, you know, whereby youth are going to be the one at the helm of our fears, you know, sometime. And um, I really hope that when we get there, we do the right thing. And I think I have an understanding of where the gap is and um, the government truly needs to bridge the gap. Yeah. Actually, that, that leads us into a comment or a question someone just asked. With a growing demand for... And yet, just before I read that, so we have a few... We have like 15 minutes to go, so I'm going to try and run through things. With a growing demand for food, most especially, oh, let me just wait for him to reload. Okay, so while it's loading, I mean it's it kind of ties into what some what okay Buki said about so that means the associations do not represent their interests because if they are seventy percent, if Um, doesn't have sorry, please resend your invitation to pass it. If 70% of the farming community is not represented in the association, then who answers to them? And that's in itself, hi, um, sorry, I was just saying something. That yeah, in I can hear you. is the reason why they don't have access to the things, the reason why they don't have access to the market, just, just the fact that the associations do not represent the interest of the small farmers is in itself a hindrance. So it's like, this is how far you can go. If you had, if you're part of an association, you could go further, right? So can we say that that is a space, a gap that can potentially be filled by someone who is able to work with the small scale farmers to form a coalition or an association that can now speak for them in the governmental spaces. And we see that is a gap that needs to be filled now. Yeah, that is definitely a gap that should be filled. But however, you know, for example, let's take a look at Poultry Pan, Poultry Association of Nigeria. I mean, let's say they put a cap for production, like um, head production, a crate of egg should be, let's say, 700 Naira, mm. you know, by uh, Pan, uh, Portal Association of Nigeria. But these big farmers, because they have more stuff, and when they don't get to sell their, their, their produce, and when, when they have blots, yeah. they can go below the price, let's say 600 Naira, then mm -hmm. they sell into the market. Meanwhile, the small orders, their cost of production, you can't compare with the, with the large farmers. You know, their cost of production is always higher. You know, they can't afford to go less than 700. But now you have the big players selling at seven, 600 Naira. That means it's going to force the small to sell at 600. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. This network, please cooperate. So get to the end of this conversation. Very well. 
Okay, so it's loading again. Okay, let me re add it. Um, yes, okay. So yeah. I'm hoping the network stays for the next what, 30 I'm so minutes. Sorry. Probably we'll do this on, uh, on, on, on Zoom another time. I don't know. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> yeah. no, it, it's perfectly fine. Yeah. yeah. So you were saying about the pan and yes. the price differences. Yeah, yeah. So 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 the big players force almost the all the time so mm. the small orders to sell. You mm. know, they it, it, it they actually pressure them to sell under their prices. You know, mm. so they sell below cost of production, which we mm. always keep. That is why our farmers in Africa will continue to be poor mm. because there's there are always big players. You know that mm. are forcing. The, the small orders to sell below their cost of production. So it mm -hmm. is sad that farmers in Africa, you know, then again, we need to understand that these rural farmers are essential for nutritional balances in Africa. Yeah, definitely. It, they are very, very essential, you know. Like, imagine we are losing millions mm -hmm. of children in Africa, you know, to, uh, to blindness, you know. Mm -hmm. Millions of children go blind in Africa because of lack of simple vitamins. It's crazy. Vitamin A, and we have a lot of women, pregnant women, you know, they die from complication of childbirth mm -hmm. due to very little vitamins and minerals, vitamin A and, um, and iron, you know, and yes. this could be got from our traditional vegetables. Then mm -hmm. we've gotten to a point whereby we are now embracing anything that is foreign is better. That is what we think. You know, but we have our traditional... Sure. Yes, we, we, we have our traditional vegetables that are high. I mean, they've done the research. I was reading the paper sometimes ago, you know, that are very high in micronutrients, lysine, yeah. micro, what have you, yeah. you know, which, which could avert this. So who is going to salvage us? So it is time for me and you and our listeners today to see what they can do to help our rural farmers and promote rural farmers' produce. For example, I live in Manhattan. Manhattan, Kansas, not New York, and local hearts, artifacts, local artifacts are sold in a way that is very expensive, you know, mm. extremely expensive, but the locals are patronizing them. Why? Mm. Because they want to promote their own, yeah. you know, local yeah. food. Right? We should yeah. encourage our family. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Okay. I think that, that brings us to a great close. Uh, just to highlight some of the things you said, um, I was actually going to ask you, what, what can the regular consumer do to help out with this? And I think you just answered that question by patronizing the local farmers. Find out what's, yeah, as consumers, we have a role to play. Find out the things that are available. Find out the, that, there's a question I asked my peers. Do, do you know where your food comes from? Do you know who grew it? Do you know? You know, do you, do you have do you have answers to any of those questions? Um, just deciding, okay, um, plan your meals around the things that are locally available. Um, find ways to make it interesting. Find ways to purchase from these people. Connect with them. As against, though, I'm just going to buy from, you know, or buy the one that has been imported. Imported doesn't mean it is extra. I, I think it's a wrong African mindset that once it's imported, it is the best. It is the only good thing, right? As though there's some there's something that degrades our local things. Nah, that, that isn't how it should be. So consumers, regular consumers, even if you're not into agriculture, this is a role you can play. And then for those in agriculture, there's a lot you can do. And we just identify that there's a gap that needs to be filled. Someone needs to speak up for the small, small holder farmers or the small scale farmers so that they can also get access to the equipment they need they can get access to um, to the market, right? These are two major, major, major things. There shouldn't be anything blocking a people. Appropriate yes, technology, yeah. appropriate <laughs> equipment, appropriate. Yes. 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 They should get access to appropriate technology. There shouldn't be anything limiting their access to those things. Those things. So, I mean, that, that is something that someone can do, even if you do not necessarily have an agricultural background. If you know about um, advocacy and, you know, 
getting into government spaces. That is something you can feel, you know, representing people. Um, so please, I hope this has inspired you in some way and that you have learned something from it. I have personally learned from it. I mean, I have notes of things I have written. So, um, yeah, thank you very, very much to Patsy for taking out the time to talk with us and share. You have shared a lot. And we are, like I told our, from our other guests, we're very proud of the work you're doing. Um, and finally, before we go, please let us know how we can support your work. How so, yeah, so go to um, Protect Ozone on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Just give okay. us a like. Yeah, at Protect Ozone. Right. Okay. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, give us a like. Then, okay. you know, you can drop some messages how you feel about this session. You know, yeah. it's going to be nice. Thank you for posting that at all. You know, yes. um, just drop us a message. I mean, I mean, drop us messages and, you know, share how you feel about the session. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, and you can stay with us on our pages. You know, you know, an opportunity might come up anytime. I'm working on some things here. You know, if you're interested, you should just shoot me an email or something. Then awesome. we are good to go. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So please, guys, follow and um, do as he said. Let, let's try and support his work. And if you know anyone who has a passion for this, please encourage them. Sometimes I feel like there are a lot of people who desire to go into these things, but it's like how it's like there's no encouragement right so please encourage those people to take those those, those steps i mean we can't see change if we all just shrink you know and run away from the work um so thank you once again thank you everyone for joining and for asking questions and commenting and all of that uh, we'll be back for another session of our robert conversation probably next month so bye bye guys bye. thank you bye